Yeah, that's no problem. I don't know if anyone can hear me, but uh, my name is Chris Lawley. I'm a gold metallogenist. I work for the Geological Survey of Canada, and I'm mostly a geochemist, and I study coal deposits. So this is sort of a, I'm going to be a strange guide through this uh, presentation that's on uh, magmatic uh, nickel systems. So that's probably as much as the introduction was going to be anyways, Ren. So thank you very much. Should I go on to the first slide? Yes, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Okay. So first of all, I'd like to thank uh, all of the co-authors that are part of this work. We started this uh, project about two years ago. And so Vicky and Jenny have been there from the start. And then we had a whole bunch of contributions from a lot of different people. Um, because at the core of this project is uh, to bring all sorts of data sets that were sort of hosted in different silos and bring them together for the first time. And since the Geological Survey of Canada has been around for 179 years, you can imagine that there's been a lot of people that have contributed to those data sets over, over, the, over the decades. And so uh, this is really sort of building on top of what all the students and researchers and academic and industrial partners have sort of contributed to mineral systems research at the GSC through that time. So I thought, you know, Ore Deposits Hub is sort of uh, celebrating a bit of a birthday. You know, it's been about a year uh, into the pandemic and it's sort of changed everything. Uh, it's sort of one of those moments where our future may look very different from the past, uh, both from the pandemic perspective, but also from climate change. Um, we really are at a tipping point where um, a lot of the tools and the things that ways we used to do things uh, may not be applicable in the future. And uh, mineral systems is part of that change uh, because we need a lot of critical raw materials uh, going forward to sort of uh, change our uh, transportation and energy systems to renewable energy. And so to get those critical raw materials, we need earth science. And so uh, it's a good time to be a geologist. Um, and so I thought with this one year anniversary, I thought it'd be kind of fun to sort of frame mineral system science within this sort of digital world. And I thought I'd explain and maybe confuse right off the bat with three different terms. So digitization is about uh, changing our analog data to digital data. So this could be like, uh, you know, film micrographs uh, converted into digital formats. It could be taking non-spatial data and turn it into spatial data. So the digitization is all about data. Uh, digitalization is all about uh, digital processes. So this is actually fundamental about changing the way we do things. So once your data is in a digital form, you can uh, then build predictive models to change how, uh, how you actually do work. And so a good example of that is actually Zoom. So you can do use uh, artificial intelligence to auto transcribe uh, meetings. That is something that used to be done manually, but now it's a digital process. So that's what digitalization is. And then finally, digital transformation. This is something that my director, Jean-Vierre Marquis, uh, really interested in about. This is sort of a, a long-term plan and the idea is that once your data is digital and you're using digital processes, your entire organization becomes digital. And so these three different terms, they're all sort of interconnected. I'd say that every different organization is probably at a different step in this process. For the GSC, we're probably somewhere between digitization and digitalization. Um, but we're within renewed uh, targeted geoscience initiative program, we're going to get more and more into the digital processes. So we're changing the way we, how we do things into a more digital world. And of course, all of this started long, long before COVID, but I think, I think it's pretty clear with all these Zoom meetings that this is not gonna go away. And so this digital transformation is only gonna sort of accelerate going forward. So what does this mean for mineral system science? So I sort of alluded to the targeted geoscience initiative program. This is at the Geological Survey of Canada. This is our big mineral systems research program. It's been going on uh, for more than 20 years. We're in our sixth phase. And we generate new data as part of the TGI program. Uh, we also develop new methods for mineral exploration targeting. But I think the bread and butter of what we do as part of TGI is thematic research. So this is where scientists uh, sort of look at how ore deposits, mineral systems form, ore deposits form. They try to identify the most important processes. And then they kind of go all over Canada and try to find the best examples of those processes and study them with the idea that if we understand the process, then we can sort of better target these things. And so the culmination of all that thematic research are these sorts of cartoons by Vouter and Sandra here in this picture in the top and the left here. Um, these cartoons are actually uh, incredibly uh, information dense representations of mineral systems. So in this case, it's showing what a magmatic sulfide system or how we think they form. Um, so we have like a mantle plume coming up 
It impinges along the base of the lithosphere. The thickest part of the lithosphere uh, doesn't allow that plume to continue upwards. And so it gets deflected towards the, uh, the margins of the lithosphere where things are thinning. Um, once we have this really hot uh, buoyant plume sort of in the thinner parts of the lithosphere, it actually induces uh, large degree partial melts. So this is where the sources of the mineral systems form. So these are sort of uh, extracting the metals from the mantle. Once those fertile melts form, we have to get them into the crust. And so there's all sorts of pathways to allow these melts to get into the crust. And then finally, we need to deposit the metals from those melts. And so um, those would be examples of sort of these melts traveling through um, sulfitic or sediments, for instance, uh, inducing sulfide saturation. So from a geological survey perspective, um, we're really interested in going back to the title of the talk, we're interested in the haystacks of mineral systems. And so the, in this case, the haystack is this area here. It's where the mantle plume is encroaching on the thinnest part of the lithosphere. And the needle in this analogy is the actual deposits themselves. And you can see in, in Voter and Sanders picture here, you can't even see the needle. And that's because the needle is really meant for what industry is actually finding. Uh, that's their job is to sort of find the deposits. Government's job is sort of identify the most prospective uh, environments to, to actually find those uh, needles or the deposits. And so this is all, uh, this is also, these kinds of cartoons are really, really important um, because they re represent the culmination of, of research at very different locations. You, you don't actually get to see the haystack or this exact cartoon in its preserved form. In the geological record, we get little bits and pieces all over the place. And so that's why these cartoons are so great um, is because they put all of that information together for, uh, for the first time. And so um, that's good. Uh, but then ultimately what you want to do is actually understand where those haystacks are in space. And so I think that's where a big data gap is right now for the Geological Survey of Canada is taking these cartoons, this non-spatial representation of mineral systems and digitizing it so that we can actually map these haystacks in space. So that's what this picture on the right is showing. So like how do we identify these really prospective environments on, based on the cartoon but in, on the map form? And so this map, the different colors are representing different parts of Canada's uh, geological provinces. So if we imagine a thin lithosphere, maybe you want to look at the border of the superior craton. So that's that light pink color. So if we kind of follow up here, this is kind of the haystack that we're kind of talking about. But you can see that a lot of the deposits in Canada are all over the place. And that's because in Canada, it's a big plate. It's a big country. We have many different types of magmatic mineral systems in Canada. So uh, we have a uh, the sort of the, the, the conceptual cartoon on the left, we have examples of that in the superior uh, Churchill and Slave uh, cratons, which are the, which what we call is the Canadian Shields. This is the oldest part of Canada. And then we have a bunch of origins, younger origins that are sort of slapped onto the side of the Canadian Shield. So one example is the Mesoproterozoic Grenville uh, province, the Appalachians, which is a Paleozoic uh, origin. And then finally the Cordillere, which is on the Western coast of Canada. So each of these geological settings are very, very different. They host different types of magmatic mineral systems. And so as a geological survey, how do we sort of um, map out the different haystacks that cor correspond to these different uh, mineral system subtypes? And so that's what this presentation is really about. So it's about taking our mineral system knowledge that we gain from uh, thematic research and digitizing it. So you might be wondering, why did we focus initially uh, on magmatic mineral systems? Well, the answer is that uh, Canada is actually a major nickel producer. Uh, we're the fifth largest producer in, in, in the world. And most of that production comes from Sudbury. Sudbury is uh, kind of a big deal, but the rest of it is sourced from magmatic sulfide mineral systems. And these systems are really interesting because they have a, a variety of critical raw materials that occur as byproducts. So for example, cobalt um, and nickel are both used in batteries. And these uh, mineral systems are also prospective for platinum and palladium. And so, um, as uh, Canada becomes more and more focused on sort of uh, critical raw materials, uh, we wanted to focus on mineral systems that are most prospective for, for, that, for those commodities. And so I, this, I also wanted to include one, at least one photo of, of rocks. So this picture on the right is from uh, when I worked for Valet um, Inco as part of my undergraduate degree. So this is a very old picture. Uh, but I wanted to include it because digitization doesn't mean not no rocks. Digitization just means changing the way we do things. And so this uh, this picture, if the undergrads are listening, it's important to keep good good track of your rock photos because you'll never know when you need them. Um, so if you're listening, take care of those things because 13 years later, you may want to use that picture. Um, 
as mentioned, I'm, I don't study nickel deposits, really. Um, I'm sort of spending a lot of my time doing geochronology. And so my perspective on mineral systems is a bit different than sort of other people's. Um, so here's a picture that I sort of drafted to try to get a geochronologist's perspective on mineral systems. And so we have some of the familiar concepts that you sort of already introduced. So we have the drivers of mineral systems. So that's the magmatic plume. That's the energy and the heat that we need to drive melting. We have the sources. So that's the large degree partial melts that develop fertile magmas. We have the pathways at a variety of spatial scales, both at the sort of, to get those melts all the way into the crust, we need uh, deep pathways, mid-crustal pathways, shallow crustal pathways. And then we have the traps, which are those sort of, how do we actually precipitate the sulfide? So I think those things are really kind of well understood. Um, but from a geochronologist perspective, we also know that there's also a temporal footprint to mineral systems. And so uh, the actual timing of mineral systems is really important. We know that individual mineral systems um, events actually are quite short lived. But I think what we've developed uh, over the last several decades is that almost all ore systems are multi stage. And so just like we can increase the spatial footprint of mineral systems, we can actually look at the temporal footprint of mineral systems and map that and include that in our predictive models. And so um, I think that's something that sort of differentiates this study from other studies a little bit is that we're actually using age uh, in our models quite a bit. And so in this case, when we're taking our theoretical criteria and mapping it to the mappable, using it as a mappable criteria, our ages are the proxy for the drivers of these mineral systems. So these mantle plumes are, are episodic and we can use the timing of those mantle plumes globally to, um, to predict uh, which, where the haystacks are. Um, sources of mineral systems, that's pretty easy. These are mafic ultra mafic hosted systems. So we're really using geology here. All of this, this cluster of data sets are all related to the pathways of mineral systems. And then finally, we have some data to support the traps of mineral systems, which are sort of our stream and lake sediment geochemistry and some of our geophysical data sets. What you'll notice is that a lot of our data sets that we use for our predictive modeling are based on the largest footprints of mineral systems. We don't have a lot of data sets to support the actual trapping mechanisms or to identify individual intrusions. The actual intrusions that host these deposits are really, really small. And so we're really focused on sort of the large scale of focusing and, and hay, the haystacks of mineral systems rather than the, the needles. And this is important because when you make that decision to look at haystacks, it actually changes the data sets that you're gonna use. And so a lot of the data sets that we have in our models are not normally used in prospectivity modeling by companies. And so I'm gonna highlight a few examples of those because there's no reason why companies can't use this data because it's free and uh, you know it's available to everyone. <clears throat> So one of the challenges uh, with predictive modeling is that we actually need uh, all of these data sets that are hosted in different databases in together into one, uh, into one data cube. And so you might ask, well, what is a data cube? Well, they're just multidimensional arrays. And I think the, the people that have really been sort of paving the way on data cubes are the Earth observation scientists. So this is information that comes from satellites. And so they have a few advantages that, that allows them to produce these data cubes pretty uh, easily. First of all, they have like complete coverage and their data is almost always the same over time. And so if you look at an earth observation data cube, you might have latitude and longitude as two of the axes of that data cube. And then you might have some time series. So you could capture that satellite might capture the same scene over and over again through time. And then we can create a multi-dimensional array of that information. So that's, that's, the, that's what Earth observation satellite data sets have going for them. Um, geologists uh, don't, don't have that. <laughs> geologists have actually really complicated data. So our data, in a way, it's not as big. Um, we don't have per, you know, terabytes or petabytes of data, but we do have very complicated data that's not spatially continuous. And so when we look at the, in the Canadian context, we've got you know, points uh, data, we've got the actual nickel mineral occurrences, we have polygons, so the geology polygons. We have lines showing terrain boundaries, and then we have all of our raster data. And so somehow we have to combine all of these disparate data sets together to do the predictive modeling. And so um, the good news is that data, data cubes can actually accommodate these sort of uh, more complicated uh, uh, styles of data. And so um, all the work that you're gonna see here was done in R. Um, I really like R, I think it's, uh, it's a great community. I've never had a question that I couldn't find answered already on, on Stack Overflow. So I've, I found it really useful. 
And so all of the spatial operations, all the data wrangling is all done using R. And uh, what, it, what this allows us to do, um, what's, what's great about this is that we can actually create data cubes from data sets that are not already sort of rasterized. So this kind of picture is trying to get you at the idea that we don't actually have to start with a perfect grid of data points to get them into a data cube. And this is really important because a lot of our models now that not the data I'm going to show you, but the sort of the next generation of these models is, are based on sort of discrete global grid systems, which aren't technically squares. They're actually unusual shapes, whether triangles or hexagons. And so we need a way of getting this uh, data into a form that's not a perfect cube, <laughs> which is sort of confusing because it is it is actually still a data cube because it's a multidimensional array. So once the data is in this cubed form, it's ready for analysis. So you could use it in any kind of artificial intelligence platform. So we used uh, H2O, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. But you could use TensorFlow as your, or any other sort of uh, predictive modeling tools. Once the data is all sort of in the same, uh, using the same resolution and in this grid form. Okay, let's talk about data. So I thought it'd be fun to sort of look at a data set that's not normally used in predictive modeling because people tend to look, companies and industry tend to focus in on their particular land tenement rather than looking at sort of the across an entire continent. So this is a picture of our of the Moho and um, it's the depth to Moho, uh, which is a sort of a, the base of the continental crust. And so you can imagine if you look at the scale here, it goes from 20 to 40 some kilometers. So you can imagine that this is a gently undulating, the base of the cross is sort of like a gently undulating surface across Canada. There's some yellow parts that are sort of thicker and there's some blue parts that are sort of thinner, but you wouldn't necessarily think necessarily that this is a particularly useful data set, but it turns out it is. And so the first step to figure out whether um, this data is, is gonna help you, uh, for you for your purpose is to sort of look at it, just look at the data distribution and so that's what this graph on the right is trying to show you. It's trying to show you the difference between the density distribution of the moho for places that have mineral occurrences, which is this red line, and places that are devoid of mineral occurrences, which is this blue line. And so what we can see instantly is that these distributions are different. Um, for places in Canada that have mineral occurrences or a high proportion of mineral occurrences, we can see that there's two modes at 43 and 39 kilometers that aren't really reflected in the barren pixels. And then conversely, uh, in most of the barren parts of Canada, we can see that um, there's a major mode at 36 kilometers that's not reflected. So this might seem quite random in the sense that like what, what does a 39 kilometer crustal thickness even mean for mineral systems? Um, but we can kind of look at this map and sort of try, try to figure it out. And what we can see is that um, the yellow parts are the thickest parts of the crust. And so it looks like the thickest parts of the crust are perspective because these are the croutonic interior. So you might imagine that these are where comadiate hosted deposits are. Whereas the secondary peak at 39 kilometers are at the actually edges of these uh, thickened pieces of crust. And so we can actually represent this numerically using uh, kernel density estimate ratios. And that's what this slide's all about. This is about taking our MOHO, which is the same data set I showed you on the, on the previous slide is just here on the left. I've overlaid the nickel mineral occurrences. And on the right, we've actually calculated the posterior probability of a nickel occurrence based on that depth to Moho. And this is just a, base, a very simple, very simple example based on uh, conditional probability. So that's what this uh, formula on the top right here is. It's the probability of nickel given you know, several data sets is equal to the prior probability multiplied by the probability of that data set given that it's nickel divided by the probability of that data set. So, the right-hand side of this equation, we can actually model using those kernel density estimates. So that's exactly those same curves. We can take that, if you remember the distribution of nickel occurrences and divide it by the blue line, which was sort of the overall distribution of uh, crustal thickness in Canada. And that gives us our posterior probability. And so conceptually, what we have basically here is the same data set, but on the left, we have the original values, depth to moho, and on the right, we have a probability value. And so this really shows um, what I was talking about, which was that the haystacks here are sort of the edges of the uh, thickened continental crust. So um, here we have this sort of, this sort of, uh, this is the edge of the superior craton, and it sort of shows up here. And then we also have the superior, uh, where a lot of the commadiate host deposits are sort of the thickest part. That's where the abitibia is here. And so those are the two, um, that's what this curve looks like uh, once you create a, a probability distribution.
You can do this data set by data set, or you can calculate joint probability distributions. Um, and the same approach is used for weights of evidence. It's basically the same formula, Bayes' theorem, but it's uh, instead of using kernels to calculate it, you just count, uh, you, discret you just basically count, um, you discretize the scale and you just count the number of mineral, curves, mineral occurrences per bucket. <clears throat> So that's the MOHO. That's sort of one of the unusual data sets that we included uh, in the model, uh, which represents some of the pathways um, for the mineral system. The other one that we really focused on or thought was interesting to introduce is sort of the drivers. So this goes back to the, the idea of using uh, time in our models. And so this picture on the left is the same curve, uh, or sorry, it's, it's the same kernel density estimates, uh, probably distributions, but it's a different uh, data set. So it's age on the x-axis here. And we can see once again that the, the, the pixels in Canada that contain a lot of nickel showings actually match pretty well with the age distribution of uh, the major uh, geological ages in Canada. But what's interesting here is that um, really highlights the point of calculating um, uh, this conditional probability because we can see, for instance, in the Archean, uh, we can see that there's a lot of showings associated with 2.6 which is sort of the sort of the Kamadiite uh, hosted deposits in uh, the uh, Yabitibi. But what's really interesting here is in the uh, Mesoproterozoic, we can see that there's an unusual peak here in the set that is significantly greater than the distribution of that age of barren rocks. And so that's why somewhat uncharacteristically, you see the Grenville as being really prospective for the drivers. And that's because um, there aren't a lot of ages of rocks this age. And the ones that are present are unusually prospective. And so this makes a lot of sense, right? This is why ratios are so important. If you look at epidemiology uh, in terms of when you're trying to track coronavirus, you might look at the United States and think, wow, that's a lot of COVID cases. But then if you take into account that there's a huge bigger population, it sort of sort of becomes uh, the, the amount of cases starts to make more sense. It's the exact same principle uh, with uh, these probability distributions. You have to calculate the ratio of the, uh, the mineral occurrences against the overall population. And then that's what's telling you what's perspective and what's not. <clears throat> so those are the drivers and, uh, and some of the pathways that we sort of focused on. We also created a bunch of new derivative products for our models. Um, so one of the things in mineral uh, systems analysis, these are called uh, feature engineering. And so this is a uh, work that Vicki Sherhart did where she's upper continued uh, some of the gravity and magnetic data sets to identify uh, boundaries between uh, different densities of rock types or um, different magnetic susceptibilities. And we can do this at multiple levels um, through the crust to look at sort of shallow structures versus deep structures. And so these are called worms or multi-scale edge detection. There's a whole range of feature engineering that you can do uh, with these data sets. Some can be really simple moving filters. So uh, you can calculate your sort of uh, uh, variance of uh, data sets to sort of add extra value um, to your original data. And so this is really important, right? This took, you know, decades and decades of work to collect these data sets, and it takes about 10 minutes to actually add value by creating these sort of derivative products. Um, so, and it's for free. So, and they actually uh, make your mineral potential models much, much better. So the conventional approach to building prospectivity models is building them layer by layer. Layer that's sort of the fuzzy logic and weights of evidence approach. We sort of um, we sort of identify which data sets support which part of the mineral system, and then we sort of add them all up. And so that's sort of uh, how I guess the current state of the art in uh, in mineral potential modeling. Um, we also wanted to sort of try to take it a bit further and using uh, some more advanced machine learning tools. And so this is where H two O comes in. Um, H2O is a, basically an artificial intelligence platform. It, it, it's a virtual Java machine. So it allows you to take your computer and turn it into, if you have multiple computers, you can make them into a bit of a cluster. And it allows you to sort of do mineral pit, uh, machine learning really, really quickly uh, using a variety of, uh, of machine learning um, algorithms. And what's really great about this is that uh, you can actually do um, use all of these different techniques actually in rapid succession. And so I kind of took, when I did, so when I started this project, I kind of took the same approach that I do when I sort of tune a mass spectrometer. You know, when you tune a mass spectrometer, you don't know exactly what's going to work on the day. You know, what, which is the perfect gas flow, you know, which is where, you know, what lens positions do I need to use? 
And so the way we do deal with that in mass spectrometry is we have standards. Uh, and so we sort of tune the instrument to things that we know the answer to. And it's the exact same approach with machine learning. Um, you have a training data and you tune your model to sort of get the best uh, results for your training data that you can. And the great thing about H2O is that you don't have to do it manually. You actually can create these grid searches and allow the model, allow the algorithms to go to search through what the best param hyperparameters are. And so this is sort of the approach that we took here. And, and this map on the right is sort of the best model that we could come up with uh, for our training data, which is based on a gradient boosting machine. And so this is a decision tree uh, approach. Um, and uh, we got really, really good results, which I'm going to show you uh, next. So we have these models. Um, we can make, you know, with by doing these grid searches, we don't just create one model, we create dozens to even hundreds of models all at the same time. And so now we've got to figure out which ones are good and which ones are bad and whether it's working or not. And so one of the ways we do this is sort of create these uh, confusion uh, matrices. And so these might be familiar to you in first year stats. So um, with confusion, with any sort of binary classification tasks, there's two ways to be right and there's two ways to be wrong. So the two ways to be right is if you predict a posit and is it a posit. And if you predict that it's barren, it's barren. Those are the two ways you can be right. And then there's two ways you can be wrong, which is if you predict a posit, but it's in barren, that's a false positive. And if you predict barren, but it's in fact a posit, that's a false negative. Now, false negatives are bad because um, you actually are sort of a misidentifying perspective area. So these are sort of missed opportunities, but false positives are really, really bad. And they're bad because people are spending money and their time and their resources on barren ground because we thought that they'd be uh, perspective. And so these different types of errors are actually related to each other by the threshold that you use for your predictive model. So if you imagine a probability from zero to one, if you pick a threshold that's really close to one, you're gonna limit your false positives, um, but you're at the same time, you're gonna actually uh, sort of misidentify uh, 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 perspective areas. And so it's a, it's a trade-off between these areas, sorry, between these errors. And so how we can represent this is called, uh, in, in different thresholds, it's called a receiving operate, operating characteristic curve. And that's what this figure on the right is. So these curves are great because you don't have to pick a threshold. So you can look at your model at every possible value between zero and one on the probability scale. And so the x-axis here is your false positive fraction. So false positives are bad. You wanna be close to the origin of this graph as possible. And on the Y axis, this is the true positive fraction. True positives are good. And so you wanna be really, really high up on this graph. And so the, what you see is here is the model broken down into different parts of Canada. And the area under the curve is a representation of how well your model is performing in these different parts. And so not surprisingly, you can see this gray one is the best performing area. This is our barren area. So this is the Western Canadian sedimentary basin. There's no deposits there. The models are really, really good at predicting barren areas. It's, it doesn't, you know, it's very simple. Um, other parts of Canada are sort of performing less favorably. And part of that is because some of the parts of Canada I left out from the training and I'm using them as a test case. And so that will explains why the slave and parts of the uh, Churchill are sort of a bit lower. It's because those areas are actually completely blind to the model and we are just testing. Uh, and so they're sort of an example of our test case. Um, there's other metrics for picking the best prospectivity model. And so this is called a success rate curve. And so instead of uh, looking at true positives and false positives as in the binary classification, we can actually sort of treat this as sort of an area reduction tool. And so as you, on the X axis, we have the percentage area of our model. And on the Y axis, we have the percentage of showings. And again, the area under this curve is an indicator of our model performance. Um, but what's really great about this model is that we can say something actually pretty meaningful. So we can say that for instance, in this case, if we run our finger along 90% of showings, we can see that that occurs in 10% of the area. So as our models improve and get better and better, we would expect to see more of our showings in the least amount of area. And this is something that uh, I, we have found really, really useful uh, for comparing models. So the figure on the left is our, our baseline weights of evidence model. So this is a relatively simple machine learning algorithm. It's just based on counting. And it's only using our continuous data. So our seismic, magnetic, and gravity data. So this is not influenced at all by uh, sort of surface exposure. So in that sense, it's really good for predicting deposits under cover because it doesn't depend on geology. But on the, but on the converse side, geology is really important for our mineral systems. And so the figure on the right is showing our preferred gradient boosting machine model 
And we can see that just by including the better algorithm and the better data, we can reduce our search pace by 33%. And so I think that's a really powerful approach for, um, for these types of problems is that by using these baseline models, we can actually say something meaningful. And I, think, I don't think that happens a lot in the literature. So I, I think it'd be great that we sort of develop sort of some standards on how we create these baseline models so that we can actually compare our model performance between studies. Every time you make a mineral potential model, the first thing that people wanna do is zoom in. And so zooming in is smart. It makes sense because you know, we, you know, creating a model across Canada is, uh, it is, like I said, there's multiple mineral system subtypes. Uh, and so people wanna sort of see how it works in their favorite area. And so this picture on the right is showing the Raglan belt. So this is in the Northern part of Quebec. This is where there's quite a few major uh, uh, Comadiate hosted uh, magmatic mineral systems associated with the superior craton margin. And what's important here is that the geology is not included in the model training process and neither are the mineral occurrences. And I don't expect you to be wowed by the resolution of this model, um, but we can correctly predict that there are two main trends in the Raglan camp, even though the, this is sort of the test case. And it also correctly predicts that the Protozoic rocks are relatively more favorable than the Archean rocks in this case. And so our next generation predictive models that we're using are sort of better resolution, so it won't be as pixelated as this. And we're using higher uh, resolution data sets as well. So uh, we're able to be, we'll be able to sort of uh, not produce these really coarse models. <clears throat> I think I'm just going to keep on going here because I think I'm just, I'm kind of going a bit slower than I thought. So um, what we can, so one of the really other interesting questions that we can ask these models uh, is uh, which data sets are the most important. And so here we can borrow concepts from the weights of evidence um, algorithm where we can use something called information value. And this is really just comparing, again, the distribution of pixels that contain showings versus pixels that are barren. And from plots like this, we can, I've zoomed in here on the top three data sets that we've got for our model. And we can see that the age, uh, which corresponds to the drivers of the mineral systems is the most important. We have several data sets that support the boundaries of these mineral systems, like the horizontal gradient magnitude, faults. Um, those are sort of the pathways of the mineral systems. And then finally, uh, the geology, which is the sources of mineral systems, is the fourth most important data set. And so the understanding which data sets are contributing most to your models is really important because it also helps you guide to, you to figure out which data sets you should actually improve to get the best model performance going forward. And so obviously geology is important. Uh, we haven't made, the Geologic Survey of Canada hasn't made a geology map since 1990, like a, a national one since 1996, the Wheeler map. And so this past uh, November, a few of us at the GSC have been working on this, which is a sort of an updated geological map for Canada that's based on the provincial data, but unified with using a unified legend. So uh, now for the first time since 1996, we can actually compare rock top types across Canada. And I haven't shown you the data for the US or Australia, but we have unified the legend for those maps as well. So we can create continuous geological maps across three countries now. And one of the cool things that we're doing um, is using not just the rock type information, but we're actually using the rock descriptions that the provinces and states use. And we've constructed dictionaries that allow us to extract different attributes from those descriptions that we can use as inputs to the predictive modeling. And that's what this figure on the right is showing. This is where every time a rock has been described as mafic or ultramafic using these dictionaries. So this is not showing you the distribution of mafic or ultramafic rocks. But somewhere within those green areas, a rock was described as mafic or mafic. And so this is really all about defining those haystacks, uh, again, rather than the needles. So the individual intrusions within those green blobs are much, much smaller. But we're trying to figure out the most prospective areas for these types of systems. And I think we've got like 14 different attributes that we can map across three countries now using our rock descriptions and these dictionaries. All of our data was you know, prior to two years ago, all of our data was in separate silos. It was sort of, which, which made sense because we had, re, we had, you know, ex significant expertise in these different databases. And so they sort of developed independently. But when you combine the data, uh, we can finally see that there are some places in Canada that are missing some or all of the data sets. And so we could never look at those data gaps before in this way because the data was stored separately. And so this is really important for our future uh, research at the Geological Survey of Canada is to figure out where we're missing parts of the data. And having our data in a data cube really allows us to do that much more easily. 
And this is an example of a process of digitalization. Uh, the next big advance for us at the Geological Survey of Canada is sort of, uh, we really focused for this study on the, combining the geophysics, geology, and geochemistry databases for the first time. But going forward, uh, we really think that we want to integrate other types of data into our data cube, like social, environmental, and economic factors. And you can imagine that just because you have a geological permissive tract, we've identified the haystack. That haystack doesn't necessarily mean that it'll be mined. There could be really remote. It could be in, an air, in a national park. It could be a whole variety of environmental impacts of mining in that area. And so ultimately, when we want to make better land use planning decisions, we can't just rely on prospectivity models that rely just on the geology and mineral systems. We have to create these economic fairways using these other data sets. And so I think this is a really important approach going forward. Finally, um, we're working with, I sort of alluded to this a little bit. We, uh, in Canada, there's sort of a big push to start thinking more carefully about critical minerals and our supply chains uh, to sort of uh, improve uh, the Canadian economy and to, uh, to prevent uh, threats to our national security. And so in 2019, 2020, and 2021, there are several executive orders signed in the USA. And so the Geological Survey of Canada is working with our partners in the USA and Australia to sort of improve these prospectivity models and combine our data sets. And I sort of gave you a sneak peek of what that could look like in the future, but we're creating data cubes that can all talk to each other. And so we can use, for instance, data in Australia and leverage that information to create better predictive models in Canada or vice versa. Um, if you're interested in the work that we're doing between our three surveys, I encourage you to check out the Critical Mineral Forum, which had, uh, which was just finished. All of the data is freely available at that link, or our latest paper in EOS. And I think this is the last slide here. Um, I kind of went over. I'm sorry about that. Um, the last thing I'd like to say is that uh, Canada just released its Critical Mineral List, so this is a rare chance for me to talk to an international audience. So if you're interested in critical minerals, um, I'd encourage you to go check out this website and you can see what Canada thinks is critical for our economy. And with that, I think I can answer uh, questions. Oh, great. Thanks, Chris. That was, that was really interesting. Um, and I've actually seen this last image here. Um, and I was wondering if the length of the stalks have anything to do with how like important, how important they are. Like, is it a graph? No, it's just aesthetics. Okay, all right, just checking. Um. So we do have one here from Ms. Uh, Lewis Kleinham, sorry to butcher your name. The question is, do you see the results of these models ultimately having the credibility to influence NIB, NIMBY attitudes and or selection of wilderness areas within various jurisdictions? I think there's certainly an interest in trying. I think, you know, one thing that the, I think is really exciting, you can, you know, we took 178 years to collect the data that I just showed. Uh, we won't be able to create new data sets overnight. So I think the exciting th opportunities for these models is to sort of integrate these other data sets that we already have prepared. Um, and so um, if we can explain the models well, and people can have the ability to generate their own predictive models, I think that's gonna be really important for uh, using these as a tool. Uh, right now, we're not doing a very good a job of explaining uncertainty or sharing the models, but I think if we improve on those uh, aspects that I think that will improve adoption. Thank you for your response, we appreciate it. Um, Ren, do you yeah. want to repeat the next question? Sure, yeah, we have, uh, we have a question here from uh, Brendan and uh, um, Brendan Purchase and uh, they're asking, in the Raglan zoom in, you said the geology was not used in training. What training data was used in this example? Yeah, so that map there in Raglan was from Marc St. Ange. So that's like a very um, postage stamp um, geology map. So it's only, you basically saw the entire extent of that map. So we used in the national model, the Wheeler map. So the 1996 Wheeler map. Um, and then, so I'm trying to trying to organize the questions so they kind of make sense. Um, there's a question that uh, from Graham, and they wanted to um, ask about the the grid side. Could you please elaborate on the grid size and shape? You mentioned they're not square. Yeah. So in the model that we used, we used a projected coordinate system. It's just Lambert, um, so they are 
kind of square. Uh, but um, but in, what, in our next generation model that we're working with in the USA and Australia, we're using a discrete global grid system. And so those are hexagons. Um, and so the advantage there is that it accounts for the curvature of the earth. And so um, it's you know closer to equal area around the world. And so that's what I meant by that. So as we're doing zonal statistics, we're taking raster data in Canada and the US, we're actually converting it to that we're calculating the, the, the values in those raster images according to the shape of that discrete global system, grid system, which is a hexagon. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, Jan, could you, could you get the next one? Yep, no problem. So a question from, sorry if I put your name again, Hunor Angus. Uh, he's, uh, the question is, how can we combine so the, the question is, this is all well and good, but how can this be combined with air conservation? The extraction process seems to be very destructive to a lot of wider species. How would the uh, reclamation process work? Yeah, so I think in terms of like the intelligence engines that I sort of referred to, it's really all about making, giving tools for people to make those land use planning decisions. It's not for the Geological Survey to Canada to actually make the decision. We're trying to give tools to make better decisions. So I think that's the important distinction there. It's still up to communities uh, to sort of make the best use of their land. And oftentimes there's multiple competing and overlapping interests from industry to communities. Um, so uh, really what my focus is, is sort of providing a better uh, information or decision-making platform to, to help with those decisions. Right. Um, we have uh, a question from a participant whose name I'm going to butcher, butcher. I think it's Taos Jorgens. Um, and uh, he would like to ask, or they would like to ask themselves. Um, so go ahead, go ahead, Taos. Hey, Chris, uh, great talk. I, I was just wondering, uh, since you guys were focused on nickel uh, nickel systems and uh, you brought up Sudbury as, as sort of the prime producer in Canada, which is not hosted in uh, in ultramafic rocks. So <laughs> how, how do you deal with uh, when the haystack is a little bit different than, uh, than sort of what you're sort of looking for? Yeah, that's a good question. I should, I should clarify that. So we were not modeling Sudbury. So Sudbury is like, obviously, as you know, is a unique uh, impact structure. So we basically, for the training process, we actually tried to remove all nickel occurrences around Sudbury um, <laughs> for the training purpose. And, and actually that turned out to be quite difficult um, because we don't have a lot of information for a lot of these nickel occurrences around Sudbury. And so uh, we did it, uh, I don't think we did a 100% you know, job on that, to be honest, but we sort of just basically manually removed things around the basin. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of funny to, to have that as the, the prime example of a producer. And then that's not the part of the, what the prediction can sort of come up with, but uh, I guess that's that's the nature of it. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Great, thanks for the question. Um, we we have a question from Nicole Januszczyk, and I actually would like to ask the same question as well. And um, she's wondering how would you address the differences in accuracy across the different parts of Canada. Yeah, so this is where when we started, you know, there wasn't actually that clear that we could make one model that would work everywhere in Canada because of those different subtypes. So in Cordillera, the Appalachians, you have convergent margins. Um, those aren't associated with uh, mantle plumes. And so like fundamentally, those are fundamentally different, um, different mineral system subtypes. And so we were surprised to see that the model performed pretty well in those areas and could actually, especially the gradient boosting model, um, could actually sort of tune the input parameters to actually make good predictions, even though it had nothing to do with plumes. And I think that's because a lot of the other parts of the mineral system are the same. So mafic ultra mafic rocks are good, <laughs> no matter what. And so um, I think the pathways are pretty much, are pretty similar, these sort of major uh, boundaries between rock types or whatever. And so, um, so it was surprising, to be honest, to see that the performance was, okay. we could actually make one model that accounted for those different subtypes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and to kind of to kind of steal steal her question as well. Um, and I was just wondering, how do you deal with the discrepancies between um, information from the same deposit? Right, that's kind of the you know if you have um, one group of people who had labeled, for example, like your dictionaries. If the dictionary definitions are different between a couple groups of people, dependent on I don't know drilling era or something like that. Yeah, so the dictionaries was kind of fun, you know. Um, 
geologists are really good at describing the same way, same thing in like a bunch of different ways. So like there are literally, our dictionaries are dictionaries in the sense that there are hundreds of words often for each geological attribute. Um, and so we had an extra challenge in Canada. We have French and English. Um, Australians uh, was, that was is sort of British English usually, but then you know, in the US they had different spellings again with US spellings. So um, the dictionaries have to account for all of those, um, all of those differences. So even a simple task like creating a dictionary turned out to be a bit more complicated. And I think there's a lot of improvements that we can make on that approach. Um, it was something that we thought we could do fairly quickly, um, but we could use much more advanced natural, natural language processing tools to sort of better characterize that, those dictionaries rather than doing it manually like we do. So to answer your question, I read million, I read, well, there's about a million polygons in our three countries combined geology map. So it was re just reading a lot of rock descriptions. That's how I did it. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, I, I need to excuse myself, but um, the another host, Tom Belgrano, is going to take over. And uh, Jan, you can continue asking questions. And um, Tom, thanks so much. All right, thank you for your, your uh, the question and for your response, Mr. Uh, Lolly. And one uh, another question from Colette Pillsworth. Sorry for butchering your name. Uh, she says, you mentioned this data was all open source. How would I go about getting hold of it if I was interested in investigating this type of analysis? Yeah, please do. And in fact, um, if you're a, maybe if you're in academia and you're a lecturer and you want to sort of do some teaching, you needed some teaching material, I really encourage you to sort of download this data set. It's not actually the, the model that I showed is actually not that big. There's only 353,000 rows. So like you can sort of um, manipulate that quite easily and your students can do the same. Um, what you need to do is you need to go to our, where all of our data is stored, which is called Geoscan, all capitalized, G-E-E-O-S-C-A-N, Geoscan, and uh, search my name, I guess, Lolly, uh, and you will find the data set there and it's all in just in a CSV. And so if you wanted to have like a machine learning competition in your school and outperform our model, I'd encourage you to do that. Um, the training data is there, all the data sets are there. Um, yeah. So it's, it's all free. And then, of course, there's a paper as well, which is an ore geology reviews and the data sets there again. Cool. Thanks for your response. And yeah, it's very helpful. Uh, Tom, would you like to read the next question? Yep. Uh, just jumping in for Ren here. There's, there's a good one from Brendan Purchase back in the chat that we skipped over. Brendan asks, uh, these models show the importance of large scale geophysical data sets. Are there plans in the future for Canada to increase the resolution of gravity seismic MT at a national level? He says, great work and excellent presentation, which I would agree with. Yeah, so, you know, I think yes, but, you know, I think we have to be realistic. You know, this took so, so much work. You know, Canada is such a vast country, and I'm sorry that it's so Canada centric, but um, it's such a vast country. So we have to be sort of realistic with our expectations. We're not going to like fill in all these gaps overnight. It took decades and decades of work, millions of dollars. I don't even know how many millions of dollars to do this. So um, the answer is yes, we are collecting more high resolution data, but um, it, you know, I think what we have what we have for, for most, if you think of like across Canada, I don't think the picture is going to change that drastically over the next, you know, five, 10 years. I think what we have, what we have. And, um, that's what's really powerful about or exciting about these other uh, research initiatives, like um, maybe global uh, satellite gravity data, um, satellite uh, magnetic data, um, all the stuff that IRIS is doing, you know, seismic, uh, seismic models and LitMod, all of these global data sets are really, really uh, becoming um, more readily available. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to use those data sets um, as well. Great, yeah. Cool. Okay. Jan, you got, got one lined up? Yep, uh, this is a question by, again, I'm sorry for uh, butchering your name. It's by Ev Barriero, Jude. Uh, I like this question too. Uh, she asked, or he asked, um, can your methodology be extended to other magmatic mineral provinces like South Africa? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, this is something that we're trying to test with Australia and the US. Um, we don't really know the provinciality of these sort of indicators. We don't, uh, this is something that we're trying to do by, by working with our three countries. Um, in theory, it should work, um, but there might be things that we encounter that are unexpected. And so is the gravity, you know, is the gravity, Bouvier gravity anomaly the same for nickel in Canada and Australia? I don't think we really know the answer to that. We haven't really leveraged, we haven't used data 
from a different survey and applied it to Canada yet. That hasn't, that's sort of an, a future area of research. So it's an, it's an exciting question. In theory, it's a good thing, right? Because um, one of the main limitations of mineral potential modeling is the lack of training data. And so if you can imagine that we can start using other people's training data, the statistics get much better. And so that's really the rationale of this, of all the data sharing that we're trying to do uh, with the US and Australia is if we pool our information, the idea is that we can make better models. And so in the next year or so, we'll be able to answer that question better. Cool. Uh, there's an interesting uh, comment from Jerry Roth here in the chat. Jerry, do you wanna unmute and jump in there yourself? Do interrupt me, otherwise I'll, uh, I'll just read out the comment. Uh, <clears throat> Someone with whose interest in predictive intelligenesis stretches back to Marco Einaudi at Stanford and the Prospector WOE system. I'm concerned that in your study of nickel prospects and deposits, you have lumped at least three major deposit types and do not appear to assign importance in terms of deposit size or economic viability. Hence, the predictive elements tend to assign equal weighting to scattered nickel projects in the Western Hudson Bay area with Thompson Nickel Camp. Any comments on that? Yeah, the, the Thompson's such a good example, actually, because um, one of the things that I did in the paper and I didn't show in this talk was sort of try to figure out uh, which deposit subtypes were not predicting very well. And so one of them is this, is Thompson, because Thompson is a remobilized nickel deposit. Um, it's not even hosted by mafic ultra mafic rocks. And that's not, and Thompson's big, right? So if you get Thompson wrong, you are missing out on some significant opportunities. And so... Um, the question's perfectly right. So, you know, to, to address that, to address these remobilized deposits, um, we haven't solved it, but I've got ideas of what we could do next. Like for instance, we could use terrains as with, uh, with, with attributes uh, that suggest that that particular terrain has a higher probability of these remobilized deposits. We could use that as extra information. We could also um, fine tune the models for those edge cases. So we could uh, like downweight whether the, Mafic Ultra Mafic Rocks have to be the host. We could do things like that. Um, the other piece that we're working on are those extra attributes. So even though Thompson uh, in the geology maps, even though Thompson is not hosted by Mafic Ultra Mafic Rocks, they're probably in the rock descriptions are probably um, saying that there are Mafic Ultra Mafic Rocks in the area or that they're stratigraphically correlated. And so in our latest models, we're actually using that stratigraphic information. And so even though there's no mafic ultra mafic rock there, it's still in the data. And so there's, those are just a few examples, but you know, these remobilized deposits are a real challenge. Cool, thank you for your response. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, a question from Francisco. Uh, the question is how we're able to, sorry, how, we're, how are the mappable proxies for each critical process selected? and how the model can test if they were the appropriate ones. Yeah, so this actually goes into something, the slide that I skipped is sort of uncertainty. So one of the things that we're doing uh, now is, you know, there's multiple lithosphere, cenosphere boundaries data sets. There's not just one lab, you know, each, each data set that predicts that boundary is based on different assumptions, potentially different data sets. And so um, one of the things we're doing is we're using, uh, uh, we're actually introducing those different data sets and seeing how it affects the model, whether it makes it better or worse and how much to try to test the sensitivity of these different data sets. Um, but to be honest with you, uh, for, you know, we are really constrained with the data that's available um, in Canada. So a lot of our, our, when we go from theoretical criteria to map up criteria, some of the options were pretty limited. So the choice was pretty easy. Uh, we have magnetic data, we have gravity data. We don't, you know, we don't have a lot of geochemistry or isotope data across the country. And so a lot of the decision was based on what we had available at the time. And, but we're testing the impact of that in, during the validation process now. Nice, okay. Great, okay. We're sort of getting to the end of the, the chat questions. I think, you know, Topics like this, projects like this, they often meet a bit of a tough audience. And <laughs> the chat was a bit like that. But really what you're doing is, you know, you're putting two, two, two and two together and making six. Uh, it's really valuable work. And the best thing about it is it's just sort of getting started. Like the real, the real capability is to come. And any uh, extra geophysical data that you get a hold of is only going to make it better. So... I don't know, Chris, if you have any sort of closing comments or anything. 
Um, no, I just say um, thank you for the opportunity to talk. I think I think Or Deposit Hub has been one of the best things about COVID, and I appreciate you know you guys doing all the spending, working so hard to get make this make this all possible. So thank you very much. Awesome. Yeah. Well, it's really a, a pleasure to have you on. We've had a couple of uh, great speakers from GSC over the, over the last year. So, Jan, I think you can you can close off the meeting. Okay. So again. Thank you for everyone who uh, tuned in to today's talk, uh, people to, that ask uh, the questions too, and also for our, our presenter today, Mr. Christopher Lawley. Uh, again, thank you for your presentation and for today's talk. It was very insightful, and we will see you guys next, or in the two weeks from now for the next OGH talk, and stay safe, and hope to see you guys soon. Bye. Bye, take care.